thanks very much for uh, facing this way and, and not looking at the beautiful view behind us. Um, so in my next, in the 15 minutes that I have, I'm going to try to convince you that uh, while I think ARDS is still important, right now we don't have a good way of, uh, of figuring out who really has the, the real ARDS, as the channel get Gattanoni would say. These are my disclosures. These are slides that uh, Gordon Rubenfeld lent me. Uh, you know that poster about uh, everything we learned uh, about life we learned in kindergarten? This is uh, everything we learned about ARDS we learned in 1967. Um, and for those of you who haven't actually read this original case series description by David Ashbaugh and colleagues, uh, it's definitely worth digging out of the Lancet uh, archives. They describe a case series of 12 young patients who developed severe hypoxemia that was refractory to just supplemental oxygen uh, administration. They, and they give very nice case descriptions of what we would recognize, Whoa, oh, that really sounds like ARDS. Acute onset, hypoxemia, low compliance, uh, a typical four quadrant airspace disease, chest uh, radiographic appearance. They list typical risk factors that we would still recognize today for ARDS, trauma, pancreatitis, pneumonia. Um, and they did autopsies on the seven patients that died, and here they found these classic uh, pathological findings that we now recognize as diffuse alveolar damage with hyaline membranes, progression to fibrosis, and congestive atelectasis. There was loss of surfactant activity, and they discovered this uh, new button on the ventilator that they weren't sure what to do with called expiratory retard, and when they turned that off, i.e., applied some PEEP. There was improvement in oxygenation, and most of the patients who survived did so after application of, uh, after they figured out that some PEEP was needed in this, uh, in this clinical syndrome. And as a sort of by the way thing, they also, so this paper highlights the value of interdisciplinary research with surgeons and, and internists uh, working together with trainees, and the value of persistence, because this paper, which has been cited thousands of times, uh, was originally rejected at New England Journal JAMA and the American Journal of Surgery before finally being accepted at the Lancet. And ARDS, as I'm sure Dr. Calfe is going to tell us, has led to lots of advances in, in, in intensive care. This is a nice uh, timeline that uh, Art Slutsky is, and others uh, illustrate here, showing the advancement in our knowledge, uh, mostly about avoiding iatrogenic ventilator-induced lung injury, to be fair. Um, but certainly, ARDS has led to an explosion of research. There's no, uh, no argument with that. And if only we could figure out how to really recognize patients with this real ARDS that have these typical pathological findings, as, uh, as outlined here by Arnaud Thiel and colleagues, of this exudative phase that starts early, and then a, fi a uh, proliferative phase and a later fibrotic phase, then it I agree, it is an important clinical entity for critical care. But how do we define this at the bedside? We don't have the luxury of getting tissue all the time. We don't want to wait to an autopsy to figure out what the patient had. So for many years, ARDS was like pornography. We didn't, uh, we didn't find it, but we recognized it when we saw it. Then along came we had the lung injury score for a little while, and then the widespread use of the first American European consensus conference definition who defined ARDS as hypoxemia with a PF ratio less than 200 that was acute in onset, uh, had bilateral <coughs> infiltrates on the chest x-ray, and a wedge pressure of less than 18. Or in the unusual event of not having a PA catheter in 1992 in these patients, you could uh, use no clinical suspicion of left atrial hypertension. So in the, in the subsequent 20 years, we found this was a useful definition, but it became apparent that there were certainly issues uh, with it, some of which are about mine here. It wasn't they were what acute meant. Uh, they talked a lot about risk factors, but didn't really include them as part of the definition. There's some inconsistency of the PF ratio. You could have, make somebody have or not have AR, ARDS, depending on how you adjusted the ventilator. And we recognized, in fact, that lots of patients with, uh, with ARDS had high wedge pressures. And the test x rate interpretation, as I'll show you, has some pure reliability. So this, and I'll just, I'll just point out, when you took autopsies uh, in cases and looked you saw, hmm, the specificity and sensitivity of this AECC definition for DAD on autopsy on, initially doesn't look terrible. Sensitivities of 75 and specificity of 
Um, oops. When you have patients with pulmonary risk factors, though, the specificity is not so great. And the important thing to understand about this, the way this uh, paper, this analysis was done, is that the chart was reviewed by intensivists retrospectively. So they had the whole course of the ARDS, of the clinical course, to be able to say, did the patient have the real ARDS, yes or no? Which is very different than, than us as clinicians on day one or day three of the ICU, not knowing what's going to happen uh, tomorrow. We did a similar analysis of the same data set, adding a few more cases. First of all, pointing out that clinicians, fewer than half the time, actually wrote anything related to ARDS in the medical chart, even in patients who died and had an autopsy that showed BAD. And when you are more strict about a day-to-day -day definition of, uh, of ARDS, the operating characteristics are much less good. Here's the base case analysis here, where the specificity is only about 50%. So half the, half the patients that uh, ADCC is calling positive on any given day don't actually have DAD. All of this was impetus to, uh, to revise the ARDS definition, and this uh, took us to Berlin uh, a few years ago. And there, the panelists again agreed. ARDS is a conceptual con uh, construct. It's just like Ashbaugh and Petty described. <coughs> Acute, diffuse, inflammatory lung injury, increased pulmonary vascular permeability, classical clinical hallmarks, and DAD on morphology. The resultant uh, Berlin definition still has ties to the AECC definition, as, as you'll see here. A few, a few things cleaned up in terms of uh, being more specific about the timing and, and how we define the chest imaging and dividing people into three mutually exclusive groups of, uh, according to hypoxemia with a little bit of uh, specification about how much airway pressure they should be on to measure that. But you may not be aware, unless you've uh, read carefully about these, uh, about the, how the definition was developed, that in the discussion phase, people were very keen on trying to define this real ARDS, this stuff that was in the, uh, the, in the Lancet paper. And we initially proposed the criteria for severe ARDS as TF ratio less than 100 with PEEP of 10, and opacities of at least three quadrants on the chest X-ray, and some um, measure of high dead space or low respiratory system compliance. And then in a validation phase, this was the draft definition here, it turned out that the real ARDS that we were trying to define, that very severe group, only consisted of about 15% of all patients that had been included in previous observational and randomized trials of ARDS that we were using as a, as a data set. And removing those extra criteria didn't lead to, led to a doubling in the number of patients, including in the severe case, but led to no change in the overall mortality. And so, based on this, a decision was made to say, well, we're, for feasibility reasons, we want more severe ARDS patients, um, and it doesn't seem to make a difference about mortality. This is how we ended up with the, with the simpler Berlin definition that we have. But remember, predictive validity, which is where we say, oh, the definition identifies people like this, where it's mild, moderate, severe, mortality of 27, 32, and 45%, is only one form of, of how to assess validity of a definition. And it doesn't necessarily mean that all the patients in this group have our target of interest, i.e. DAD. In fact, that's true. Uh, the group from um, uh, from Hatafe here again reapplied their autopsy database using the Berlin definition, and, and you can see that okay, there is a gradient, and as you get into the more severe ARDS categories, more patients have DAD, but a lot of patients that we uh, label as having ARDS do not have DAD on uh, on autopsy, even, and these are the extreme cases who died, presumably patients who didn't die might have even uh, worse results than this. And part of the pro so what's HARF, hypoxemic acute respiratory failure versus ARDS? Let's say HARF of non-cardiogenic origin. The only difference then between that and ARDS is the chest x-ray. And the problem is the chest x-ray is not a very good uh, discriminator. 
This is a study that Gordon Grubenfeld did in Toronto uh, years before he came to Toronto. He brought with him to the, uh, to the Toronto Critical Care Medicine <laughs> Symposium an armful of chest x-rays, back in the day where you actually had chest x-rays in your hand, of consecutive hypoxemic patients. And he asked clinicians and experts who were there just to say yes or no. Everything else being good, does the patient have ARDS? And the good news was that this doesn't project greatly, but this is an x-ray of four-quadrant airspace disease. Everybody said yes. <laughs> This is a pretty normal x-ray, everybody said no. The bad news is, these only made up half the x-rays. The other half were made up of x-rays like this, you know, the sick patient sign with a PFDA catheter in, there's some, some subtle pulmonary, fluffy pulmonary edema that uh, doesn't show up really well in this, uh, in this light. But here, the experts were no better than flipping a coin. So does the patient have ARDS or not? I don't know. Let's, let's, uh, or is it HARF? Let's flip a coin. That doesn't sound like a very good uh, diagnostic strategy to me. And things haven't gotten any better in terms of the x-ray. This is a nice study that uh, Shannon Goddard and Eddie Fan led as a nested RCT within LungSafe. They asked LungSafe investigators to look at a series of 11 prototypic chest x-rays that were, where experts had judged them already as consistent, inconsistent, or equivocal. And on the left-hand panel here is the score of how people did. And you can see that most clinicians got five, six, or seven out of 11 correct. Or put another way, their right response was just under 60%. And even train, uh, this training set where they randomized half the clinicians to look at the x-rays beforehand and then uh, redo them afterwards, had absolutely, uh, had absolutely no effect. So <clears throat> I think there's lots of, of limitations with the Berlin definition. I'm allowed to say this because I was one of the people who uh, helped develop it. Predictability is only one criteria for a revised definition. Many variables of interest were discussed but not included, and I'll, show, and I'll touch more on that in a, in a couple of minutes. Let's just skip through here. So what about HARF? Here's the um, part of the consort diagram from LungSafe. So they had 4,500 patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. 3,000 of them had ARDS. So already, most patients with HARF have ARDS when you apply this definition. Although interestingly, only 40% of those ARDS cases uh, were recognized by clinicians. And if you look at the other causes of HARF other than ARDS, let's exclude heart failure. Pneumonia is the, uh, the primary one here, and so many of these patients probably had the, same, uh, had the same thing. Their outcomes are similar to what we found in the Berlin definition. These are data that are not published that uh, one of our fellows, Martin Erner and, and Eddie Fan, have put together from an observational registry of ventilated patients in uh, the <coughs> University of Toronto ICUs. Again, respiratory acute respiratory failure outlined across the three PF ratio groups here. More post-op uh, in the higher PF ratio group, but similar looking um, reasons for, for mechanical ventilation as we see in ARDS series. And outcomes, just HARF, with severe HARF, very similar outcomes to severe ARDS as we, as we defined. Slightly lower mortalities in the less uh, sick group. Now you might say, well, we need to use ARDS because we know that that's how we define uh, lung protective ventilation that should work. But I'll put it to you that probably this trial was, was positive because lung protective ventilation works in all kinds of people who may or may not have ARDS. And if we look at other more specific sort of anti-inflammatory therapies, this is, a, this is an old uh, table from the 2000 review article, but the message is still the same. We see a recurring theme of no benefit, no benefit, no benefit, no benefit, whatever we try, doesn't work. And that's probably because of a signal to noise problem. And if we illustrate this, if we have a randomized trial where most of the patients don't have ARDS, even if we have an ex extremely effective therapy which reduces mortality in ARDS patients by 50%, that still only gives us a very small signal. That's probably not going to be statistically significant. Whereas if we had a more specific definition, that same very effective therapy, now we have a much bigger effect size than in absolute terms that we might actually be able to, to detect. So I'm sure uh, Dr. Kalf is going to show you some phenotypes of ARDS like this, and, and I completely agree that we need to be really nailing down differences in what we're calling 
subgroups or endotypes of, of ARDS, but really they should be, in my opinion, endotypes of HARF. Because not only do they, do they come out with different inflammatory patterns, they respond differently to treatment. In phenotype 2, the more inflammatory treatment, you can see there's a beneficial effect of PEEP. Whereas PEEP may be harmful in the, in the majority of patients. And look at the number, 145 out of 550 actually had the, uh, the, the real ARDS here, as we might call it. And, and here's what I was saying, where we, we thought about lots of stuff that you might want to include in the ARDS definition, including imaging, a lot of stuff on the origin of edema, but for either feasibility reasons or because we don't actually have the data on how they work, um, these weren't included. And so in my last slide here, I'll say that I think generally we need explanatory trials before we do big pragmatic studies that are going to be negative. We need to tailor definitions to according to mechanism of injury. And I think what we need urgently is a comprehensive observational study of hypoxemic acute respiratory failure, replicating some of the work that, uh, that Carolyn's done, but not just limiting it to people who were already labeled as ARDS, because maybe there are other people who we've not identified that might be, including the and there are people that we've labeled as ARDS that don't really have it. I think until then, HARF is a more feasible umbrella uh, syndrome. Thank you very much.